The process of animation was a process of giving life, of literally taking the inanimate and making it animate. It was at base a hubristic process in which the animator assumed and exercised godlike control over his materials, in which it vicariously offered a feeling of empowerment to its viewers who sensed the control. For Walt Disney, the surge of empowerment was so great, one might have concluded animation took the place of religion for him. Indeed, the animator created his own world an alternative reality of his imagination in which the laws of physics and logic could be suspended. Walt Disney and artists like him are often criticized for promoting escapism. Our reality requires real answers to real problems, not cowering from them. Walt would recognize this disparity and sought to remedy it with one final project, a project he'd never get to realize. Instead, his legacy has left us in a media landscape dominated by spectacle and sensationalism. It is clear in popular culture today, the most successful art offers the most engrossing alternative reality. But is it really the escape we are after? Escape is only the first of three stages of world building by which we consume and create. The story of Walt Disney will take us through each stage, and other artists will help guide us along the way in an effort to answer how artists turn reality into imagination. Disney grew up in many places, but the town that would forever shape his mind was Marceline, Missouri. He'd catch a glimpse of what idyllic country life was like in Marceline. A feeling of freedom with the animals and characters that live out there. That is what you experience when you go into the country. You escape the everyday world, the strife and struggle. You get out where everything is free and beautiful. But it was all too quickly stripped away. He would spend the rest of his life trying to recover that feeling. Leaving Marceline disenchanted young Walt. The Disney family was never financially stable, and life seemed to get progressively more difficult. Walt's only escape then was drawing, and as he grew older, it was clearly his only ambition. Not only was he determined to make money from his pictures, but he was determined to make a name for himself. He had a sort of undifferentiated ambition. He wanted to be somebody, that's for sure. He wants to be an artist and cartoonist from the time he was little. He took a pass on factory work in Chicago, and headed for Kansas City instead, and landed a job as a commercial artist for a local ad company. Through his commercial work, Walt discovered animation. The fledgling medium offered unparalleled control of the moving picture. No regulations or no customs or no conformity. It was wide open to what people wanted to make of it. Walt figured if he couldn't compete with the established picture houses in experience or quantity, he could outdo them in quality. If the painter wishes to see beauties that would enrapture him, he is master of their production. If he seeks valleys, if he wants to disclose great expanses of countryside from the summits of mountains, and if he subsequently wishes to see the horizon of the sea, he is lord of all of them. Leonardo da Vinci. The glory of being an artist da Vinci realized was that reality should inform, but not constrain. On the page previous to these writings, da Vinci sketched an impressionistic panorama depicting the rocky hills and verdant valley surrounding the Arno River near Vinci. There are a few familiar landmarks from the area, a conical hill, perhaps a castle, but the aerial view seems to be, typical of Leonardo, a mix of the actual and the imagined, viewed as if by a soaring bird. Art provides every man with the capacity of a god to create worlds, entire universes to their discretion. It can fill the absence of pleasures or reflect the great tragedies of life. What it gives us is a means of reconciliation between the dissonance of our reality and the desires of our being. The relief Walt Disney found in his art quickly made him a household name. Disney engulfs the animation industry. The Great Depression allows Disney to scale rapidly, acquiring industry-leading talent at a discount while other studios cut back spending or cease production altogether. While the original Mickey Mouse Adventures kept the company afloat, Disney was able to double down on his demands for quality and would release the first ever feature-length color animation, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, in 1937. The world premiere of the million and a half dollar fairy tale fantasy, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. We had the, the family fortune, we had everything wrapped up in Snow White. Walt was in a state of high anxiety. People don't buy this, this will just fall flat. It was a resounding success. 
Though it was critically acclaimed and made a decent profit, the studio was never financially stable in these early days. But about two years later that I was almost broke. Quality comes at a great cost. High quality animations come at the greatest cost. Pressure from the business side of the company forced the studio to customarily cut spending and maximize profits. The studio was an informal, frat-like environment teeming with boundless excitement and creativity. It quickly devolved into another Hollywood industrial complex, a shift which would dishearten Walt and his staff alike. But the studio would never again feel like family to Walt. He becomes then like a typical industrial boss. Disney becomes completely conventional. Calls for unionization across Hollywood encroach on the Disney studio. Walt, seeing this as a threat to his absolute control, actively resisted union activity within the studio. Employees at the Walt Disney Studios had been begging for better wages, extra pay for overtime, and a uniform system for determining job titles and screen credits for months. After the strike, Walt distrusted everybody. And this wouldn't be the only problem. On Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war. America had entered World War II, and with animators enlisting and audiences not attending theaters, Walt had to find alternative means of keeping the company afloat. Sequence one, let it roll. Military contracts severely limited Walt's control. Officers occupied his offices, break-even budgets limited flexibility, and some of his greatest talents were on strike or had enlisted. Fighting his own war on two fronts would forever change Walt. I don't feel at home in the world. You know, it, it can be like a really hideous experience. So I wanted to make a place uh, where I could be at home. My standard, even if that standard was completely fantastical or totally out of this world, and have that be my, my anger. This video was initially inspired by a conversation between the conceptual artist Alex de Corte and his friend, writer Charlie Fox, and their desire to construct their own spaces in order to set their own rules and standards. I'll make a new ideal or a new standard. And that is what these worlds are, I think. Coincidentally, Corte and Fox both credit their work to growing up in Walt Disney's worlds. The two relate to empathizing with the Disney villains more than the Disney protagonist. They're really like, they're apart from the normal world. Like, Cruella de Vil's gonna go and live off in like, Hell Hall, her amazing house with the dying trees that looks like something from like a Roger Corman Poe film or whatever, and just sit in bed and smoke cigarettes and like dream of, but they wanna be, she wants to be an artist. Contrary to his humble everyman persona, Walt similarly was not invariably cheerful. He was deeply troubled. Thought of as a hail fellow well met, good natured, but he wasn't. Walt Disney is in many ways a very dark soul. And one could say that he fought that, fought that darkness, tried to find the light. It is relentless discontent that motivates an artist to augment their reality, to enforce their control over what's malleable. Animation was no longer Walt Disney's passion. The union strike, the war, and the lackluster return to feature-length films post-war had extinguished his enthusiasm almost entirely. Walt had been able to exercise absolute control over his world until others in the real world sought to interfere. Walt's next passion would begin as a purely personal hobby. From his time in Marceline, Walt Disney loved trains. When constructing a new home, Walt planned for a half mile long mini train track in which he'd play engineer, uniform and all. This new hobby gave Walt the taste for tangible alterations to his environment. If the animations, the animators, and the studio itself would no longer conform to Walt, Walt would conform reality itself. Disneyland would serve as Walt's greatest obsession. Disneyland is your land with the hope that it will be a source of joy and inspiration to all the world. The park was to be an organic entity, ever-expanding, an inexhaustible source of creative inspiration and endless possibilities to exercise control. Except, it wasn't. It couldn't be. The park was remarkably successful. Walt had planned for every contingency, the synthesis of everything he had learned in the film industry. Disneyland was to be the greatest film production ever devised. Engrossing its audience not in a theater, 
but in a complete and contrived environment. Its great success was its downfall. When constructed, Disneyland was only accompanied by orange groves and dirt streets, but its success inspired urban development and Disney was eventually surrounded on all sides by the hideous reminders of the real world. He'd again need another escape, another means of control, but one that could be future-proof, and even further, one that could redefine his legacy. I, I more and more think that the job of art is to present you with other worlds, and they can be novels, or they can be films, or they can be pieces of music or paintings. Brian Eno, an English musician known for his ambient electronic music and collaborations with artists like David Bowie, The Talking Heads, and recently Fred again, has a compelling definition for the job of art and its capacity to explore worlds. Okay, I'm going to live in that world for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to exist in that and see what it feels like to be in that world. We probe the possibilities for the future uh, and for alternative locations and so on by living them in a model. Building models to prepare us for the future so we may feel some sense of control over the indeterminable outcomes and inevitable persistence of nature. That, to me, is the most important thing that we do really as humans, where we, we probe the possibilities for the future. By first controlling the narrative, we earn the authority to change the world, really. Fighting the darkness can't stop with a fleeting control of the present, but embarks to inspire control of our future. Conscious optimism of what can be, what humanity is ultimately capable of. Walt Disney's final endeavor would trump all his ambitions before. No city of today will serve as the guide for the city of tomorrow. A declaration of human ingenuity. So this is Epcot. A living model to inspire the future. I believe we can build a community that more people will talk about and come to look at than any other area in the world. And with your cooperation, I'm sure this experimental prototype community of tomorrow can influence the future of city living for generations to come. It's an exciting challenge. A once in a lifetime opportunity for everyone who participates. The full extent of Walt's ultimate dream will forever remain in his imagination, never manifested into reality. Man has a dream and that's the start. He follows his dream with mind and heart. And when it becomes a reality, it's a dream come true for you and me. That says we're going places. There's progress ahead.